Gentlemen, as you know, Mr. Allen has been in the thick of the Cold War since its very beginning. You're familiar with his very distinguished record as a career diplomat and troubleshooter. But just for the record, let me recall a few of its high spots. Four times in critical periods, he was assigned to frontline ambassadorial posts in Iran, Yugoslavia, India, and Greece. He has been Assistant Secretary of State for the Near East, South Asia, and Africa. In 1948, when Congress decided we ought to have an overseas information program on a more or less permanent basis, Mr. Allen was put in charge. And last fall, the president decided that this important activity needed Mr. Allen again. He brought him home from overseas and made him director of the United States Information Agency. Mr. Allen attends the meetings of the Cabinet and the National Security Council. Mr. Allen... Why is it that everything the other side says is propaganda, while we call what we say information? <laughs> Lindley, the word propaganda has taken on a very bad connotation. It was originally a perfectly good word, but it brings to people's minds now the idea of uh, twisting or distorting the truth or even manufacturing complete falsehood, whereas we try in our service, our output, to uh, give as straight a, fact, a factual presentation as we can. We feel that that is information and it should be labeled as, not uh, called propaganda. I wonder if you could give us an example of Soviet propaganda, particularly as applied to the armed services which these gentlemen represent. Well, I had today uh, with me uh, a, a book that the Soviet government puts out in its, for its training course of the armed services of the Soviet Union. The book is called Marxist-Leninism on War and the Army. I'll just read you one description of the way it uh, talks about American army officers. It said, U.S. US armed service officers are corrupt, weak, run by Wall Street, and, quote, professional robbers, in quote. Well, I call that propaganda. Well, Mr. Allen, that applies to all officers of the armed forces. Do you have a comparable piece of Soviet propaganda that applies specifically to the Army? Well, I'd like to show you on that a film of uh, the meeting of the American... Uh, uh, and the Soviet armed forces at the Elbe, uh, the River Elbe, during the, at the end of the last war. And you'll see how the Soviet government and their information service present this meeting of the two armies. Could we have the film? Let's see what really happened at the Elbe before we view scenes from the Soviet film. We are outside of Torgau, Germany, on the 26th of April, 1945, at the first official meeting of the American and Russian armies. The film you are seeing was made by Signal Corps photographers of the United States Army. You will see a glimpse of the Elba River Bridge in the background. The meeting took place to arrange a meeting of Corps commanders on the following day. Prior to this time, only patrols of the two armies had contacted each other. Here are Major General Emil F. Reinhardt, Commanding General of the 69th Division, 5th Corps, United States Army, and Major General Rusikov, Commanding the 58th Guard Division, Red Army. General Reinhardt said, and I quote, I crossed the river and waited for a short time as the Russians thought the meeting was later than 1,600 hours. Rusikov and I discussed the details for meeting of the two Corps commanders the next day. I was impressed most with the cordial attitude of the Russians. Unquote. Now to the Soviet version, complete with Korean dialogue. Oh, 
Now for the Soviet proof that our army officers are corrupt. As we see our play-acting general dally on the doorstep of decadence, complete with lady friends and stock ticker in his office. This is a literal translation of what they're saying. General. What's this? What's this? Girlfriend. What's the market doing? General. My stocks are going up. Girlfriend. Sell for the profit. General. Get me my broker. Yes, Wall Street. I'm making money like crazy. Huh? Mr. Allen, what do the communists have to say concerning our Air Force? I'd like you to listen to a broadcast from Moscow on that subject, which talks about the psychoneurotic American pilot. Could we have that soundtrack? You are tuned to Radio Moscow, broadcasting in the 16, 19, and 25-meter bands in the shortwave, and in the medium on 216.6 meters. An associated press dispatch tells us that an American saber jet accidentally dropped some rockets over Florida. The population has been alerted and warned of the serious danger. This brought to mind a secret report of Dr. Frank Berry, medical assistant to the Secretary of Defense, which made me doubt that the rocket fall was the result of an accident. This report gives us every ground for questioning the possibility of accidents in general, since it claims that approximately 70% of the officers and enlisted men of the Air Force are psychoneurotic. What is more, Checks have shown that the state of affairs is especially critical among the airmen doing steady nuclear patrol. What are they saying about the United States Navy? And the Marine Corps? I've got a copy here of the Soviet newspaper that's published for their Navy called the Sovietsky Float, the Soviet fleet, May 18th of this year speaks about what's going on in the Mediterranean. It says, referring to the United States, over Lebanon hangs the real threat of military intervention by the imperialist state led by the United States. He says, the American command has doubled the landing forces attached to the Sixth Fleet. That's the Marine complement with the ships. The imperialists are openly brandishing weapons, threatening Lebanon. But no matter how much the colonizers try, they cannot intimidate the people of the Near and Middle East, and in particular, the Lebanese people, who have set on the road of defending the freedom and independence of their country. That's typical of the type of statements that the Soviets are making about the United States Navy and the Marine Corps tools of imperialist colonizers, Wall Street, so forth. Mr. Allen, don't the Soviets in their propaganda attempt to show also that Americans are opposed to all the colored races? Yes, they do. They, I've seen that particularly when I was serving in the Far East and in India. They try to make it appear that the Americans are and the most race-conscious people in the world, actually, the experience of people in that part of the world dealing with Americans is the best way to counteract that. When our naval ships or our armed services units are stationed in those parts of the world, the uh, integration that takes place in our armed services is the most um, useful way to combat that type of Soviet propaganda. Also. Last fall, we had uh, a magnificent experience when we uh,
Marian Anderson went out through the Far East and India making her appearances uh, as an American and speaking to the people about the racial questions in the United States as an American Negro was an excellent counterweight to that Soviet propaganda. I believe that Soviet film, Meeting on the Elbe, has a sequence uh, mm. uh, charging us with racial discrimination and, in fact, fierce racial hatred. It might be interesting to take a look at that. This sign in German and Korean says, this is your home away from home. scene from the Soviet film, The Partisan, depicts another army activity for the Oriental theater goer. It is the fate of this Korean girl to be taken up the hill for a dawn execution. Here is a literal translation of their conversation. The officer says, if you surrender even now, your life can be saved. And the girl says, the daughter of the partisan, even though captured by the Americans, is certain that you will pay. It pains me not to live, to see you pay. Understand the communist propaganda system, its organization. Uh, it appears to me that this must involve quite an elaborate chain of command, if I may use that term. I'll draw your attention to this chart here. Uh, the Soviet government has gone all out for propaganda. That is, very recently we've seen how they've written several letters, Khrushchev or Bulganin, to President Eisenhower. The letters are addressed on the envelope. To, president of the, to the President of the United States, but what they are really intended to are that all the world, just for propaganda purposes, not as a solid, a serious uh, document from one government to another. Now, the uh, Soviet government is headed by the party presidium. That's just a small group of people in Moscow who run the 200 million people of the Soviet Union in their hands. There are two elements, the government and the party machine. Those are quite separate. The government is merely a bureaucracy. The party machine really has the power. They use all the means of communication and contact with foreign people to spread their propaganda. Uh, just take, for example, radio. The Soviet government, every week in some 50 foreign languages sends out 2,300 hours of broadcast beam toward foreign countries in foreign languages. You say, how can you do 2,300 hours in one week? It means in each language they do so many hours, and if you multiply that, the number of hours by the number of languages, 2,300 a week in uh, broadcast. They have mass <coughs> books and publications which they send abroad in various foreign languages. Interestingly enough, many of those books and publications that they use in the Near East and the Far East and South Asia, India and those countries, are in English because that's the best language to reach the intelligent public in those countries. They use films, 
They use exchanges, that is, exchange of visits. They bring large numbers of, of uh, Indians or Egyptians or Chinese or Greeks, or anybody else they can get to the Soviet Union, give them tours around the Soviet Union, send them to universities in the Soviet Union. Uh, great party congresses of the communist parties uh, in all the countries, they call together and have big meetings in, in Moscow. Going back uh, just for a minute for exchanges, the Soviet Union put on one stunt last fall, uh, summer in which they spent more money than the entire United States government does on all of its information and cultural relations work for a whole year. For one month in Moscow, the Soviet Union had 50,000 students from all over the world brought to the Soviet Union for the great youth festival that we hear about. The 50,000 delegates to the youth festival are gathered in the Moscow Stadium to hear about the Soviet version of peace. Delegations parade around the huge stadium, waving gaily to the capacity crowd. The national flags of participating delegations passing in review. Followed by groups displaying their national dances. The word mir is Russian for peace. And there's Khrushchev. Here's the delegation reported to be from the United States. In keeping with the festival scene, the Russian hosts release hundreds of white doves the age-old symbol of peace. And the daytime entertainment climaxes with a spectacular display of precision formation. Delegates also sightsee in the Kremlin during some of the daylight hours. And this is the kissing ceremony, as the boys select the girl by throwing a scarf around her. Sort of a Soviet version of drop the handkerchief. entertained at the Bolshoi Ballet. Outside, in the streets and parks of the city, there is entertainment of all kinds. Hold everything. It's undulating new alley. A curvaceous beauty from Char Zoo, which is near Samarkand, if anyone cares. But it's back to the stadium for the grand propaganda finale. Here is the symbol of destruction. The tail of the bomb looks like an American eagle. Both must be eliminated. Bomb and the eagle. The cards say peace, Russian, peace in English, and peace in French. Mr. Allen, what uh, percentage of the people who attend these festivals that you mentioned are communists? 
Well, we don't have any exact figures on that, but uh, the best we can calculate of the 50,000 that went to the Soviet Youth Festival last summer, uh, we estimate that about half of them were non-communists. That is perhaps 25,000. I was in Greece at the time myself, and I know that I think there were about 200 Greek uh, young people went to the Soviet Union for that festival. And uh, uh, many of them were just going for the ride who wanted to get the trip. It was a chance to go and see the Soviet Union. And as long as the Soviet government will pay all expenses, actually, in that case, the Soviet government took a young man from Greece, took him to the Soviet Union, kept him there for a month in good uh, hotels, accommodations, food, all expenses, traveling around the Soviet Union, took them to the very finest theatrical performances, the ballet and the symphony orchestra and the opera and so forth, and back to Greece, all for the equivalent of $50. Also, they act through international fronts, that is, uh, youth organizations, college students around the world, or labor organizations that don't admit that they are communists. Uh, but are infiltrated and run by the hardcore of communists in those organizations. And through those means, they throw out their propaganda to the non-communist world. Uh, as an example of the way they do, in a totalitarian state such as the Soviet Union, they have complete control of all their means of, of communication. And they can say one thing in the Soviet Union and entirely a different thing outside the Soviet Union or even to different countries outside the Soviet Union in the language of those countries. As an example, take recently, uh, when there was a threat of an attack on Syria. The Syrians claimed that there was a threat of an attack by Turkey. The Soviet Union was saying to the Syrians, you are being threatened by the Turks. They were saying that in broadcast in the Syrian language to the Syrians. To the Turks, though, in the Turkish language, they were saying to the Turkish people, the Americans are in there forcing you and using you as tools to attack the Syrians. You can tell an entirely different story in different countries without any hesitation. I've got a chart here that shows the way the Soviet Union parcels out its radio broadcasting in these many languages. Uh, in order to get a, as much of a varied effect as they can. For example, in the lower part of the chart, it shows how much broadcasting the Soviet Union does overseas to foreign countries. That's uh, 900 hours a week. This, incidentally, is the Voice of America broadcast to 730 hours a week altogether to the world. This is the Soviet broadcast just to foreign countries, not in the Russian language, but in foreign languages. These are the broadcasts by the European satellite states, that is, uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, and so forth. They do about the same amount altogether as the Soviet Union does. These 317 hours are done by Communist China. Then 125 hours each week are done by the Far East orbit, that means to say North Korea and North Vietnam. And then there's 108 hours now being done by various clandestine radio stations, broadcasters, who are situated in one place or another claiming that they are, for example, the South Korean broadcast. They're actually broadcasting from North Korea, but announcing that they are a South Korean broadcast. That's where the clandestine comes in. So you see that the Soviet Union uses all the satellite countries to do broadcasting uh, outside the communist orbit, as well as the Soviet broadcast themselves. Mr. Allen, uh, I wonder if you can amplify what you said about the Soviet distribution of magazines and books abroad. I've seen some very startling <coughs> figures on that. Do you happen to have them in mind? Well, I uh, have some figures about the publication of the magazines. They are putting out 85 periodicals in 30 different languages. That periodical means uh, magazines and quarterly reviews and things of that sort. As far as books are concerned, last year they poured 100 million books into the free world. 
And they usually sell at very low prices. Yes, don't they? usually, or they give them away. Stalin, I wonder if you would discuss, first, uh, the main propaganda theme of the communists today. I have a chart here, which I'll show you on that. These are just taken five sample propaganda themes of the Soviet Union. One of them is that it's the United States that puts up the Iron Curtain, while the Soviet Union seeks closer relations with everybody, that we are the people who have the real Iron Curtain, and they just uh, want to embrace the world. Secondly, they're constantly saying that, it's, that the United States is a warmongering country, that we want to bring about a world war, whereas the Soviet Union peace seeks peace and disarmament. They say that United States capitalism can no longer compete with progress under Soviet socialism, that they're going ahead of us in production. They also say that the communist countries will surpass the United States and its allies in growth and strength, and also that the United States is fighting a losing battle to maintain its colonialist hold on the new countries of Asia and Africa, that we are the imperialists and we are trying to dominate those countries, but their national spirit will survive. Mr. Allen, these are all examples of communist propaganda successes. Aren't there some things which they can't cover up even with their uh, highly touted propaganda? Yes, uh, lots of them. For example, just very recently we've seen the, the very bad effect on the Soviet public relations posture in all countries, particularly in Europe and the United States, by the execution of the former Prime Minister of Hungary, Nodge. There have been tremendous demonstrations now in Paris and London and Bonn and other places by socialist and left-wing fellow traveler people who are terribly annoyed against the Soviet Union because of the execution of Nodge. And there's nothing that their propaganda line can do about it. They've just lost a great deal of Support. Stalin, uh, aren't the communists using film a lot in this propaganda field? Yes, they are. Both documentary type of films and entertainment films. And in the entertainment film field, they have recently been very active. As a matter of fact, very recently, they won an international award at Cannes in France. The film is called The 41st. Oh, yes, I've heard about that film. I believe it's about the girl who's a Red Army sniper and the boy who's a white Russian officer. They're shipwrecked and fall in love. But they have a quarrel over communism, and that proves fatal. Let's see what happens in this communist love story. Safe from the shipwreck, out of the sea, across the ice, comes the girl, a Red Army sniper, and her prisoner white Russian officer. She has killed 40 men with her rifle. Got lots of fat. Yes, but will it burn? On the Volga, we often use it. Burns better than wood. I couldn't the others have got to as well. Might be better to the cross out worn by the man is another communist identification of the enemy. All right, go ahead then. Forget I'm here. You first. I'll wait outside till you're ready. Don't be an idiot. The wind's still raging. You're liable to catch your death out there. I was only trying to save your embarrassment. You and your high and mighty ways make me sick. This is a front line, not a drawing room. Go on, what are you waiting for? Anybody'd think you were shy. Communist girl, eager to fight, 
now finds her prisoner sick and discouraged. The never-ending tide of hatred and death. It's all just a gory nightmare. No one likes it, but it's the price of progress. Yes, and you can have it. As far as I'm concerned, all I want is peace. In my book. In other words, you don't care if our enemies scheme to destroy us. So long as you can read your books, others can go hang. I say, let them. <laughs> Damn it! Why should I take the world on my shoulders? Besides, what has the world done for me? Search As for a man who opposes communism, right our hero again. becomes confused. There are so many truths. The Germans, the Russians, the Muzik, the ruling classes, the Bolshevik. I say, to hell with a lot. I don't care what happens. Leave me alone. I'm out of it all, and I won't spoil my hands again. What you're saying is others should poke in the mud for your honor. That's their own affair. I don't care. I'm no longer interested. I see. Mariuska, don't be angry. Wait. I don't mean to hurt you. Don't you understand? I'm sick at heart. Exhausted. Let's get away from here. Go to the Caucasus. I've got a summer house in Takumi. If only you'll go with me. I'll help you to study. I'll be good to you. I promise you. You're asking me to turn my back on my conscience, cast aside my obligations, loll around on cushions, munching candy, bought with the blood of my comrades. Don't be so melodramatic. Oh, yes, I forgot your class likes to hide ugliness by pretending it doesn't exist. Is that all? I wonder how you can blow yourself up with so much hot air and forget that you're a woman. It's been thrust on me by people like you. How dare you think I could so far forget myself as to desert my cause and lie around your house in idleness like any slut, you bastard of aristocrat! That's about all I can stand. Stick to your damn doctrine. Scum that you are. It's lucky for you that there's such a thing as chivalry towards your sex. I hate you! What a demoralizing effect you have on me. I should have had more sense. Yes. You and your wishful thinking. I can only hope I've brought you down to earth a bit. Have I? Oh, you have. So you admit you were wrong. Yes, it's all clear as day to me now. Thanks to you, I've stopped fumbling at last. I was wrong to think I could go back to my books. There's work to be done. And there's a life to be lived. And damn me, I live it. I warn you, I'm no longer meek and mild. But now on, I'm a man with a purple. Oh. <laughs> You might at least tell me what that is. All right. As I see it, my country needs me now more than ever. Idealism must give way to realism. For it's plain that if her destiny is to be left in your hands, I dread to think what a mess you'd make of it. By all that's holy, save. <laughs> Oh, they're coming here anyway. Could be going further east. 
God! first victim of her rifle and the title of the picture mr. Allen how can we compete with this communist propaganda in view of the fact that the communists can resort to any deceit whereas we have to stick to the truth I think first and foremost that um, we should do more of what we've just been doing this afternoon that is we should recognize Soviet propaganda, when we see it or hear it, uh, sometimes it's very subtle, and sometimes it's in a disguised form. But uh, most Americans don't realize how much of it is being put out uh, or what it is when they see it. Now, uh, secondly, we must do more ourselves. That is, more counter-propaganda and more uh, presenting the story of the United States and the American way of life and the democratic principles that we stand for. We are doing a great deal. This afternoon, we've only considered what the Soviets are doing in this field, but I haven't talked about what we are doing and don't think we've been holding our hands and doing nothing. We haven't done as much as we should because we Americans are not inclined very much in the propaganda field, but we've realized that it now has to be done and uh, we are doing more of it. But thirdly, and perhaps more important, we should do everything we can to deprive the communists of fertile ground in which to plant their propaganda. Now that means, as far as the government is concerned, that government should follow policies which uh, make the United States uh, admired and respected and liked uh, as much as we can know that there are many cases in which we can't please everybody. It's quite true. But our policy should have a public relations uh, aspect to them and should win friends. But more than that, each of us individual Americans should behave, act, when we are individual Americans and respect us. And then these signs, like Yankees Go Home, they will, we will have them. They will continue. But they won't have fertile ground, they won't catch on if all of us Americans, civilian and military, behave in the way that we should. Thank you very much, Mr. Allen, for this very interesting discussion.